So what are some examples of numerical invariance for knots? In other words, for a given knot, how can we associate with that knot a number, and today it's going to be a positive integer, in such a way that that number only depends on the knot itself and not on the diagram that we use to represent that knot? These numerical invariants we're going to take a quick survey of include the unknotting number, the bridge number, and the crossing number. And this presentation parallels chapter 3 in Colin Adams' The Knot Book. So the first invariant that we'll meet is called the unknotting number of a knot. And we define the unknotting number to be the minimal number of crossings that we need to change in a diagram in order to turn that diagram into the diagram of an unknot. So this is the first of three numerical invariants that we're going to see. And in each one of them, one of the key words in the definition is the word minimal. This is what's going to make it something which depends only upon the underlying topology of the knot and not on the diagram itself. But it's also what makes these numbers very slippery and difficult to actually uh, work with sometimes. So let's take a look at an example. So here's the figure eight knot for sub one. The question of finding the unknotting number of this knot is the question, how many crossings do I need to reverse on this diagram from over to under or vice versa? How many crossings do I need to reverse in order to unknot this knot? Can I do it, it's like name that tune now, can I do it by reversing one crossing? And so I'll kind of look through the knot and say, what if I reverse this one? Would that make an unknot? Well, no. What if I reverse this one? Would I make an unknot? No. Um, what about this one? Oh, wait a minute. That one I think will work. Right? Because what's going to happen if I reverse this crossing from an over to an under instead? Well, now I have this non-trivial, this dull loop down here at the bottom, which I can write a Meister type 2 away and end up with this. And then I've got a couple of just sort of boring twists that I can write a Meister 1 away. And sure enough, what I get is a diagram of the unknot. So for the figure 8 knot, all I needed to do was reverse one crossing, and that was enough to get me a diagram of the unknot. So the unknotting number of the figure eight knot for sub one is one. And so we got pretty lucky here, right? Um, but in a way, finding the unknotting number is a lot like name that tune. If I couldn't find one crossing who, which would do the job of unknotting this knot, then I would sort of amp it up a little bit and say, all right, what if I can choose two crossings to reverse? Then could I get the unknot? And so then I'd have four choose two different places to, to try and, and look and see if that works. And if I can't find any combination of two crossings, then I would amp it up again and say, can I do it by reversing three, uh, and so on and so on. Some of the results that are known about uncrossing, uh, unknotting numbers uh, of a knot is that uh, if the unknotting number of a knot is one, as the example that we just saw here, the figure eight knot that we just had, its diagram was uh, uncrossing, uh, unknotting number of one, um, then that means that the knot has to have been a prime knot. This is actually a super useful result, right? It gives us a way of detecting whether a knot is prime, which is something we were kind of anticipating would be a really hard problem in the last video, because it is a hard problem in general. Um, but this at least gives us one way of saying, here's a criterion that will tell us that a knot is prime. Now, not every prime knot necessarily has a knotting number of one, but any knot which has an unknotting number of one can be guaranteed to be prime. And that's a proof that was done back in the 80s um, by Charlemagne. So that's cool. And what about knots that are not prime? If I build a knot out of the connected sum of two subknots, uh, then what do I know about the uncrossing number? And this inequality tells us that the uncrossing number of a connected sum cannot be any larger than the sum of the uncrossing numbers of the subknots that build it. So if I take two knots, this k1 and this k2, I form their connected sum, k1 hashtag k2, um, then why is it reasonable for me to expect that the unknotting number of this big knot cannot be any larger than the unknotting numbers of the two subknots? Well, if the unknotting number of k1 is denoted by u of k1, then that means by changing u of k1 crossings over here, I can turn this purple subknot into an unknot. So if I switch u of k1 crossings over here on the left, and likewise if I switch u of k2 crossings over in this green part of the diagram on the right, I'm going to turn this into an unknot. I'm going to turn this into an unknot. And this connected sum in the middle is then going to be connected summing two unknots together, which is going to give me a diagram for the unknot. So in other words, it will always work to just switch all the crossings on the left, switch all the crossings on the right, and in total switch the sum, uk1 plus uk2 crossings. That will always unknot the connected sum. The question is, 
might we be able to do it with fewer switches? Because now we have kind of this connector here in the middle. Maybe that connector is going to open up an opportunity for there to be fewer crossing reversals needed. Uh, so we can't necessarily guarantee that in general, um, but it could be possible. So this inequality here um, is, is something that we can't turn into an equal sign because it may always be possible to use fewer crossings uh, to reverse. So that's the unknotting number. The next numerical invariant we're going to look at is called the bridge number. Um, this one's cool for me because it has these neat three-dimensional pictures we can associate with it. The definition of the bridge number of a knot is that it's the minimal number, so there's that clause again, the minimal number of unknotted arcs that lie on either side of a plane that bisects the knot. So now we're going to really think of this knot as living in three dimensions. We're going to slice the knot with a plane in the middle, and that's going to cut the knot into a bunch of arcs that go up and down over that plane and also uh, down underneath on the underside of that plane. And the minimal number of arcs that we get in that process is called the bridge number. So for example, here's a diagram that's actually a diagram of the trefoil knot, 3-1. Uh, and if I slice it by this plane here in the middle, then all I would want to do is count the number of arcs that I have above the plane and below the plane. Above the plane, I have this arc highlighted in purple. That's arc number one. And I also have this arc highlighted in green. That's arc number two. Below the plane, I also likewise have two arcs uh, that are connecting here this way and this way. And all these arcs are unknotted. I haven't like magically tied a little knot here in the middle of this one, right? They're unknotted arcs. Even though they sort of twist one with another, each one of them is individually an unknotted arc. And so for this knot, the bridge number is two, because above here I have two arcs, below here I have two arcs, and I can't make a diagram with a trefoil knot that only has one arc on the top and the bottom of this. And in fact, the only knot that has a bridge number of one is the unknot. So the bridge number of the trefoil is 2, according to this diagram. Okay, another way to think about the bridge number, because uh, it's a little hard sometimes, particularly if you're working with a complex knot, to be able to visualize the knot inside of three dimensions, as we did with the trefoil in this example. So how would we have done this if we had a diagram instead? And this is where the name bridge comes from for bridge number. We can think of a bridge in a knot diagram as an arc that only crosses over a bunch of strands, one or more strands. Right? So this strand right here is an example of a bridge in this diagram because it only crosses over strands. It crosses over one or more strands, namely this one right here along its, along its route. But then that means that in this diagram with a trefoil, I have actually three bridges. Each one of these arcs that I draw is actually a bridge because each one of them makes an overcrossing, one overcrossing with another strand in this diagram. And so that leads to the unsatisfying prediction that the bridge number of the trefoil is three, when in fact we just found that by the original definition, the bridge number is supposed to be two. And this is where the minimality clause comes in, right? The bridge number is going to be the minimum number of bridges defined in this way in any diagram of the knot. And so unfortunately, perhaps, maybe fortunately, depending on your perspective, that means that what we can do is we can change the diagram, as long as we're not changing the knot, we can change the diagram using Reitermeister moves and planar isotopies and whatever we need to do, change the diagram in a way that might illuminate there being a possibility of having fewer bridges. So for this trefoil diagram, what I can do is I can take one of these arcs and actually sort of move it, slide it over to change the diagram. I actually physically had to do this with a rope on, on a table before I actually figured out how this actually works. Um, but by moving one of those strands over, I can get a new diagram for the same knot, right, that looks like this. But what you'll notice is now this diagram has four crossings, one, two, three, and four. But it represents the trefoil still, because all we did was a Reitermeister move. And how many bridges are in this diagram? Well, I can find one bridge right here, right? The red strand here is a bridge because it only has overcrossings, and in this example, it has two of them. It goes over this strand, and then it goes over that strand. So that's one bridge in my knot diagram. But then if I keep going, the next little arc here is not a bridge at all, right? Because it doesn't have any overcrossings at all. It just goes kind of from an under to an under. So this piece, this arc, is not a bridge in my diagram. Continuing along, the next arc, this one here, has an overcrossing followed by another overcrossing. And so that is another bridge in my diagram, over, over. And then this last little arc in here doesn't have any overcrossings, and so it's not a bridge. So what we've done, even though we've now introduced a diagram that has new crossings that our original diagram doesn't, it now shows that we can get fewer than three bridges. In fact, we can get only two bridges in some diagram of a trefoil knot. And it turns out that's the most 
reduction that we can achieve uh, in a knot diagram for the trefoil, um, that we're never going to be able to draw a trefoil diagram that has only one, one bridge in it. Um, and again, we can show that the only one bridge knot is the unknot. But now we've therefore reached that minimum, and so now we've shown in a knot diagram perspective why the bridge number of the trefoil should be 2. So what are some of the properties that the bridge number has? Um, here's one that's super useful for us. It says that any rational knot will have a bridge number of 2. So the trefoil is an example of a rational knot, right? In fact, we can kind of see what its tangle number is right here, right? It's just a, it's just a three-crossing tangle that's been closed up. Um, but we can show that, in fact, any rational number can have a bridge number of 2. And in fact, more is true. In fact, it goes the other way as well. Every two-bridge knot is actually a rational knot. We can come up with a rational tangle whose numerator closure uh, is equal to that knot. So this is super powerful because it gives us a complete classification of rational knots using the bridge number. Every rational knot has a bridge number of 2. And any knot which has a bridge number of 2 must be a rational knot. Therefore, if I can find a knot that doesn't have a bridge number of 2, then I know that knot's not going to be rational. So this is super useful. Um, we can also have a result that tells me what to do with connected sum. How does the bridge number work if I connect two knots together with a connected sum? So here are two two bridge knots, K1 and K2. Right? In fact, the one on the right here is actually a, a diagram of the of the figure eight knot, 4, 1. So what's going to happen when I take these two two bridge knots? It looks like if I just sort of take them in isolation, I should end up with a total of four arcs above and below. But if I take the connected sum of these two knots, I'm going to be removing a little piece of an arc in between and then connecting them up. And what's going to happen is that that connected sum is going to connect one of the arcs from my knot on the left with one of the arcs from my knot on the right, and it's going to turn that into a single arc above and a single arc below. So the bridge number of the connected sum is not just adding together the bridge numbers of the two, but it's adding them together and then it's taking one away because the two knots, when we connect them together, are going to share one of these arcs. So the bridge number of the connected sum is the sum of the bridge numbers minus one. And what's super cool about that is it actually gives us a result about prime knots that connects them with rational knots. This is the corollary. The corollary is that every rational knot will be a prime knot. So this is another super powerful way of detecting primeness. It tells me that the entire class of rational knots are actually prime. So here's the proof. Suppose that I have a rational knot, and I can express the rational knot as a connected sum, k1, hashtag k2. Then, according to fact number one from over here, that means that the bridge number of k must be equal to 2, right? because rational knots have bridge number of 2. But on the other hand, fact number two tells me that the bridge number of the connected sum is going to be the sum of the bridge numbers minus one. Right? So it tells me that two is going to be equal to the bridge number of k1 added to the bridge number of k2 minus one. Now let's add one to both sides of that equation. It shows me that if a rational knot can be built out of a connected sum of k1 and k2, then the bridge numbers of k1 and k2 have to add together to give me three. But the bridge numbers are always positive integers greater than or equal to 1, right? And so if I'm adding together two numbers, uh, whole numbers which are greater than or equal to 1, and the sum is 3, there's only one possibility, and that's that I'm adding a 1 and a 2. So one of these knots has to have a bridge number of 2, and the other one has to have a bridge number of 1. So either K1 or K2, and without loss of generality, we'll say it's K1, K1 has got to have bridge number of 1. But what does that mean about k1? It means that k1 is a trivial knot. It's the unknot. And so that gives us the proof that if a rational knot can be written as a connected sum of k1 and k2, then either k1 or k2 must be the unknot, and therefore k is prime. So that's a super powerful result um, that uses the bridge number to give us this connection between rational knots and prime knots. The last numerical invariant for knots is one that we've hinted at before in the past, but now we're going to put onto a more firm foundation. It's the crossing number of a knot. And by definition, the crossing number is exactly what it suggests that it is. It's the minimal number, there's that phrase again, minimal number of crossings in any diagram of a knot. So here's an example of a knot diagram. This is the knot that's called 7 sub 3. So if this is my knot diagram, K, the diagram has seven crossings. 
And therefore, what can we say about the crossing number of k? Well, we can say the crossing number, the best we can do is we can say the crossing number is no more than 7. There exists a diagram of this knot that has 7 crossings. The hard question is how do we know that there's not another diagram of this knot that has less than 7 crossings? Maybe it has 6, maybe it has 5, so forth, right? So the hard part about crossing number is knowing when we've gotten to that minimum. So how do we know that we can't eliminate any more of these crossings through some clever combination of Reitermeister moves or planar isotopies or maybe by seeing this as a connected sum of two prime knots and then we can focus on those prime knots, right? So how do we know that? Um, so that's a hard question that I'm just going to kind of leave out there because that's going to require some more firepower uh, to be able to distinguish knots that have the same number of crossings one from another. But the result that I want to close with is the result about what happens to the crossing number in the connected sum of two knots. Um, so let's suppose I have these two knots, this seven crossing knot and this six crossing knot. Um, both of these happen to be prime knots. Uh, in fact, we can show that they're rational knots, which makes them prime. Um, and both of them have been sketched here in an alternating projection. So the crossings alternate over, under, over, under in both cases. So if I have two alternating projections of knots and I form their connected sum, and the question is, uh, what happens with the seven crossings from over here and the six crossings from over there? Will all seven and all six of those still be needed to describe the connected sum of these two knots? Or might the operation of connected sum allow me to undo some of the crossings and get a smaller crossing number for the connected sum? And it turns out that because these projections are alternating, when I join them together, it's not going to give me any clever Reitermeister ability to eliminate any of the crossings. And so for two alternating projections, when I take the connected sum, the crossing number of the sum is exactly equal to the sum of the crossing numbers. All of the crossings from the, the knot on the left, all the crossings from the knot on the right, they were essential for each of those knots and remain essential in the connected sum. When the knots are not alternating, this becomes a much more interesting question uh, that we're going to have to leave for later. So these are three examples of numerical invariance numbers that we can associate to knots that don't depend on how we draw the diagram for the knot, but which only depend upon the underlying topology and type of the knot. But they're not complete invariants, because there are a whole bunch of different knots that have a crossing number of 7. There are a whole bunch of different knots that have a bridge number of 2. There are a whole lot of different knots that have an unknotting number of 1. And so none of these is powerful enough to completely characterize the type of a knot, for that, we're going to need to turn next to invariants that have more algebraic structure than just a single number. So we're going to think about objects like groups and objects like polynomials that have a little bit more information associated with them, such that we can hope that they're going to be complete invariants for knots.